Hello again, friends, and welcome back to another episode of Real Talks. I'm your host, David Steele, and I'm flying solo for this one. Elisa will join us later today for our main topic podcast, which will be all about Pixar and a preview of the upcoming movie Lightyear. There was some developing news about it, which we'll get to later. Just a friendly reminder, if you like what you're hearing, you can follow us wherever you get your favorite podcasts. Just search Real Talks. That's R-E-E-L Talks. Just like my name, S-T-E-E-L-E. Also, you can follow us on social media. I can be found on Twitter at WannabeRounder, LinkedIn, and on Instagram at DCaduto. And Alyssa can be found on Instagram as well as at Alisa Ivers. That's all lowercase. Just a couple of quick announcements. Our revamped Patreon channel is now live. You can find it by typing Real Talks into the search bar. Let me tell you a little about it. We're offering four different affordable levels to support us at. $3, $8, $15, and our largest is only $20 a month. If you do choose to support us, you'll have the opportunity to get some great perks, such as your name shouted out before every podcast, cool merch, and if you're one of our major contributors, you'll get a one-hour monthly Zoom meeting with Alyssa and myself, not to mention one unpublished podcast per month. For more details, just go to the website. I'll leave the link in the description. Which leads me to my next big announcement. Flashback Fridays have now begun, and we are a few weeks in. This is where Ann Cargard and myself will be talking about films from the past. The last film we talked about was Iron Man 3, and then we're going to be doing every single MCU movie in chronological order. Stay tuned for this week's episode, where we will be talking about Thor, The Dark World. I can't reiterate enough. Hit that follow button so you never miss an episode. So today is a bonus episode. We have a very special guest on the show. He hails from Toronto, Canada, and has been a graduate of USC screenwriting program for several years. While there, he was an associate editor for the Southern California Review. Before that, he attended Western University and graduated with a bachelor's degree in business and sociology. As if that wasn't enough, he returned a few years later to get a postgraduate degree in rhetoric and composition. With all of that extensive education, it paid off because a little over two and a half years later ago, he authored a highly touted book entitled The Secret of Screenwriting, Everything You Should Know. He is currently the head of Over the Overview Entertainment, where for the last 10 years, he has provided consulting strategies for entrepreneurs, startup companies, and entertainment, and more. He's also written or co-written eight feature-length scripts to date, including the 2016 the pro- project The Holdout, which was a magical realis- realism dra- dramatic short film based on his script. I la- I'd like to welcome Brad Rocheford to Real Talks. So where can people reach you on social media, Brad? Hey, David. I want to say thanks for having me on the show. I'm excited to be here. Uh, if people want to find me, you can find me on LinkedIn. It's Brad Rochefort, which is R-O-C-H-E-F-O-R-T uh, on LinkedIn. And you can find me on Instagram uh, as uh, screenwriting.live. Nice. Yeah. Cool. Cool. So I got to ask, take me back to the beginning. Where did this passion for film come in, in movies? I've always liked the movies. I think... Uh, being young when the VCR was introduced was fantastic as a film fan. We're going back to the early mid eighties and you had access to, you know, decades of films for a couple of dollars. And as, uh, as kids, we watched a lot of movies. I always took the perspective. Yes. I liked my favorite actors. Yes. I thought they were funny, but I knew that the writer was the one that wrote those jokes and the writer was the one that made them funny. And that, that appealed to me that, ability to make people laugh and to entertain uh, just drew me in. And from a very young age, I thought I wanted to be a writer and, and see the world from that perspective of connecting with so many people and bringing that joy. So when it comes to movies, do you have a favorite genre or actor or actress or director or, or you just like the whole spread? Yeah, I tend to like action, comedy and drama. Definitely the blockbuster movies are a a favorite. Lately, Marvel movies are at the top of my list. I have seen almost every single uh, Marvel movie in theater, uh, including the Eternals, 
uh, which was the last one I saw in theaters. I'm psyched for the new uh, Thor Love and Thunder because I think Taika Waititi is fantastic. Um, he'd be up there on my list of directors. Uh, his output is fantastic, going back to like uh, Boy and Eagle vs. Shark, which are like smaller indie pictures that are they're like the the New Zealand version of uh, Napoleon Dynamite, which I don't know, David, did you see Napoleon Dynamite? No, no, I'm, I'm, I haven't, but I heard it was hilarious. And actually, one of his that got critical uh, claim was Jojo Rabbit. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, who, who else I like? I'm definitely a fan of Quentin Tarantino. I have his, uh, his box set on the shelf uh, behind me here. You can see uh, nice. got nice. one of them. Yeah, Tarantino is, is he actually outstanding. So yeah. Reservoir Dogs, Pulp Fiction. I personally believe Pulp Fiction is his master class. Um, you know, once, yeah. a time, once Upon a Time in Hollywood was good. Um, but yeah, so Pulp Fiction for me all day long. But yeah, Tarantino is, oh, that's, that's awesome. Yeah, for, for me, that's it was Kill Bill. Awesome. I, I saw yes, Kill Bill Kill 1 Bill. and 2 in theater, and it was, uh, it was fantastic. I think I left the theater and someone had written in the dust of a public bus um, about the Hattori Hanzo. It was just, it was that popular that it was everywhere at the time. Um, I think he's just done a fantastic job. Him and uh, and the Coen brothers, they're such a huge yes. influence. They have such uh, a wide variety of films, but they always draw you in. And uh, I mean, I could go on. I could go on for yeah. hours. Yeah, Fargo. I mean, it's just, yeah. yeah, it's just, that's probably their most popular movie. So you... Let's get back to Marvel for a minute. Yeah. So you said you're a huge Marvel fan. So I'm curious, have, did you see the, the new Spider-Man No Way Home? Yeah, of course I did. Okay, so um, let me ask you a question because a lot of people believe that with Marvel's oversaturation, oh, wow. Yeah. For So yeah. Th this is on our, this is, we'll have to show this later on, but for all of our listeners, he is holding up something that's incredibly... Uh, valuable it's it's the what's called the marvel encyclopedia if you are yeah. a marvel fan of any such that is what you want to get yeah. everything I've, of everything of everything um i've so, actually got two have you ever seen i want to show you this one because you're a fan okay absolutely so yeah marvel is just so actually let me go back i'm going to put a shameless plug in here oh wow yeah oh yeah we're gonna have to clip this and put this on on uh somewhere just to, so everybody could see this this that's really really cool yeah um yeah so um yeah marvel has just by the way if you want to go back and listen to a couple of the podcasts so we as i made mention in the open flashback fridays are underway we just did iron man 3 we're doing thor the dark world this week uh go back and listen to the mcu as a whole that's where uh ann and i talk about the last 15 years of Marvel. And let me get back to that because I think that's, so do you, as a screenwriter, and do you think Marvel has oversaturated the market with movies because they're just, they're just bringing them out, Brad, like two and three a year. And what ends up happening is that the great movies or the really good movies don't get the attention. Mm -hmm. Yeah, David, I think they're great. I, I think they're fantastic. Like I said, I've seen almost all of them in the theater dating all the way back to Iron Man. Um, I've got some of them. I keep reaching for my shelf behind. Yeah. I'm going to have half my shelf on the desk by the end of the podcast yeah. here. Um, I've got some of the Marvel movies. I think I've got some of the Iron Mans. I uh, had uh, Guardians of the Galaxy, which is just an absolute favorite. Loved yeah. Guardians Dream's of the Galaxy. Dream's Gun is just, I'm curious, and I know where. Have you seen the new Suicide Squad? I haven't. I have and not seen that yet. It's much better than David Akers. Yeah. And yeah. it's just got the whole Guardians vibe to it. And it's it's a twist on uh, it's a little blatantly violent, but it's it's good. It's really good. So let me ask you, the oversaturation of Marvel movies. Do you believe that that's hurting cinema Not at in all. general? No. no. I I think you're getting people out to the movies. I think when you hear people uh, uh you know, people like Martin Scorsese who sort of spoke out against it. I think that is just a bit of um, just a bit of smack talk in the industry. You know, Marvel has had twenty hit movies in a row or more, 
and um their ability to tell a story across time and space is so admirable that anybody that speaks out against it either is jealous or didn't watch it because i tell you the one of the most moving feature film experiences of my life was uh avengers endgame that that was so profound and authentic it was not a fanboy moment it was just a piece of culture and i think me and the hundreds of other people in the in the theater we all felt that together so absolutely they're not they're doing everything right. They've got people talking, they've got people going out to the movies. And the more you go to the movies, the more you see the poster, the more you get into the habit, the more you go to the theater and you watch it online. I think they're doing great things. Yeah. Um, I think a couple of things. I think Scorsese actually, because he grew up in a different generation yeah. and because he was the Bronx, New York and, and you know, the whole hard Italian lifestyle. I mean, don't get me wrong. His his movies are masterpieces, yeah. which, by the way, we're going to try and put together uh, Mob Mondays. So, I mean, we're, we'll be talking about all of these movies, but like a Goodfellas, like a Casino, like a Mean Streets. So I think that partially was something to it. But the other thing about Marvel, so there, to me, there's three or four things they do well. Number one, their writing is impeccable. They know yeah. how to mix the comedy and the dramatic with the, you know, the, the corny. Number two, which you were bringing up, the emotion. And I think that's where, and we'll get into this a little bit later with characters, is their character arcs, you care about the characters. So when everybody went away in uh, Infinity War, you were emotional about it. It wasn't yeah. just like a one-off, and that was it. Um, and number three, they have the ability to promote things perfectly. Whether it's an end game or a smaller film like Thor, who's not really a big character or just whatever. Um, so, speaking of big movies, yeah, the Batman just came out in March. Yeah, and I know that you were a. Um, I hyped it online for sure. Yeah. Yes. So you actually wrote an article and about the screenwriter, and yeah. so. Um, one of the so let me just read a small tidbit from it. It says this year almost everyone I talked talked to said they had gotten their butt kicked by COVID nineteen, but there's still hope for screenwriters like Matalin uh, Tomlin, who didn't let the twenty twenty stop him from writing part of the biggest script of the year. The upcoming now, mind you, th when I read this to you guys, this was written in twenty twenty, so this the film's been released. Uh, didn't stop him from writing the biggest part of the script of the year. The upcoming Warner Brothers Pictures DC Films movie originally set, slated for Ben Affleck, known as a Batman. Wise for, over, wise for his years, the 30-year-old AFI film graduate talked about its influence about great filmmakers and screenwriting and finding his own voice. And this is from Matisse himself. There comes a point when you realize that following your path is all you're going to be doing is copying them and in this way, that isn't going to make for great art because it's not true. These people are so good because they know how to use their voices. And you go on and say that kudos to Tomlin. So let me ask you a question. You've seen the Batman, I imagine, right? I've, I've seen it, yes. What, what did you think of Matt Reeves' vision? Um, I liked it because it was a compliment to the other Batman series, and it was his own. I wasn't thinking about... 1980s, 90s, or 2000s, or 2010s Batman, or 70s Batman, or comic book Batman, it felt like I was watching a graphic novel come to life. Like, I, I'd read some of Jeff Loeb's Hush, um, those uh, graphic novels from the early, mid-2000s, like uh, A Long Halloween. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with them, yes. but they were, they were excellent, excellent stories. Uh, and I felt like Matt Reeves created and set his characters in, like, a a pulsating city. It felt like a real place. It, it felt like was supposed to be, I think Gotham City is supposed to be Jersey. It's just off of New York City. It, it felt real in the best yeah. of ways. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think the other thing too is all of the other Batman, for example, the, those films, we had never seen a Batman in year two, right? Yeah. We had always seen the Batman that was established, that was kicking ass, that was just he was Batman, but we had never seen a Batman that was still trying to find himself. And that's where Robert Patterson 
and Bruce Wayne and back. He was still trying to fight. And I loved even the first five minutes of the film. You hear the voiceover. And in that voiceover, you're, you're hearing he doesn't know who he is yet as a crime fighter. And then you see the, you know, year two. And I think that in itself gave a really good indication of where this movie was going to go. Um, the screen, I thought the screenplay was amazing. It was completely different. So for me personally, I think it should get five Academy Award nominations. I think it should, even though, even, even if it doesn't win, uh-huh. best picture. Uh-huh. I think it definitely should get a best screenplay be, uh, nomination. And uh-huh. I know it's early. It's it's down the road. People are going to forget about this, but it still deserves one. Paul Dano absolutely deserves Paul, a, nom- love Paul a nomination. Love Paul Dano. Absolutely. Original score. The score yeah. is unbelievable. And yeah. I believe Matt Reeves should get a, uh, a nomination, too. Uh, do you think that's kind of out there, or do you think those it should get at least that many? I'll say this. Traditionally, the uh, voting body for the Academy skews 70-plus. But there will be a turning point, and the gravity will shift towards younger films. Uh, are we going to see that this year? I, I don't know. I'm, I'm excited to see... When that happens, I think, you know, Matt Reeves' choice of putting Nirvana in the soundtrack was brilliant. Uh, what you were just talking about, seeing Batman in year two, that, that brought me back to the movie thinking, we haven't seen Batman as a young man, experiencing that young man life. And I think the life of Kurt Cobain, who was the front man for Nirvana in the 90s, his life, Kurt Cobain's, was crystallized in that, like, mid-20s angst. Because he didn't live past 27, Kurt Cobain. Uh, so for Matt Reeves to choose to use that song in the film um, made us, as a culture, subconsciously think this is someone going through that mid-late 20s angst. It's a brilliant use of, of art across decades. So I hear you. I hear you for sure. Is the Academy going to recognize the fact that that art has grown up and these artists have grown up uh, and... The Batman used those uh, elements of art and storytelling brilliantly. Yeah. Um, now, on the flip side of the coin, we have No Time to Die, yeah. another th- three-hour film. And so this was another piece that you wrote um, about uh, big business being Bond. Yeah. So yeah. James Bond is back after a reported delay. Once again, this was written in 2020. Uh, from COVID-19, the fictional spy is set to debut his 25th movie adventure in November of 2020. With the front franchise approaching its 70th anniversary, it stands to be one of the most powerful brands in entertainment, thus valuing this at over $20 billion back in 2015 with the release of Spectre. Um, and it go, you go on to say that you know it's a $250 million budget, and this is going to be the last time we see um, Daniel Craig. So let me ask you, and I'm sure you by now you've seen No Time to Die. I haven't. Really? I haven't. It, I have okay. just. Yeah, it's on my list. I even looked earlier okay. today. I was like, where can I stream this? It's, it's coming what? to streaming soon. Okay. Um, I had thought, I, I mean, so I would say this. For what it was, I understand what the producers were trying to do. Yeah. I get what they were trying. They were trying to streamline the story with James Bond. From all the way back in 2008 with Casino Royale yeah. to Quantum to Skyfall. to and, and I thought that was good to a certain extent. But I thought my biggest problem, my biggest yeah. problem with the film, and when you watch it, I'd be curious to see your analysis, is... In every single Bond film, up until this point with Daniel Craig, you had had a midpoint where the Bond meets the villain. Yeah. In this particular film. It's really and I'm not, And there's no spoilers, yeah. so don't no worry. No spoilers, yeah. It, it, yeah. Uh, yeah, so you don't see him until about 20 minutes left in the film. Really? Because Christoph Waltz, go, you see him. Javier Bardem, you see yeah, him. Yeah, right. Yeah. And, and he was underrated. He was completely underrated. But without going into too much detail, it just could have been better. Gotcha. And I that now that's all film subjective, and it's a personal opinion. I would be very very curious to see 
once you watched it, yeah. how everything, and there were a couple things, and I know you have to suspend disbelief. Oh. Oh, I'll show yes. you my, my James Bond book All here. All about it's, Bond. Yeah, it's a, so, it's a great, great book. Yeah, so let me ask all you. The way up to, uh, all the way up to Daniel Craig, too. Nice. Very yeah. nice. So let me ask you, who's your favorite James Bond? Uh, it's Roger Moore all day. All day. Okay. He goes to space. Beautiful he goes kill, to America. Octopussy. He goes skiing. He goes on boats. It, it, it was super cool watching Robert Roger Moore be a spy. I, I thought it was fantastic. Yeah. No, that's yeah. that, and that's one of the great films of uh, just in general in the franchise. I mean, we always yeah. talk about Marvel and Fast and Furious, but Bond has been yeah. around for a long, long oh, time. And I think I, it's an I, underrated film, uh, John, uh, film franchise. Yeah. So let me ask you a question. How did you come about starting Overview Entertainment? Uh, I finished grad school and I needed uh, a company. Pretty much. I, I, I knew um, I went to USC. I got a master's degree in screenwriting, uh, studied under Sid Field, who was, uh, you can see his books on the shelf here. Uh, up there, I've got his mm -hmm. books. Uh, and if you don't know, he was considered the guru of all screenwriters. He was the, the foundational uh, teacher of screenwriting at USC. He wrote his bestseller, million copy bestseller, screenplay in 1979, uh, which has just sold unbelievable amounts of copies. I think it's in hundreds of colleges. Uh, you know, it was just for a generation, the book, and he was the teacher. So I took very seriously that I was like a guardian of that knowledge because I had him in person with like eight people in the class. Um, I didn't take lightly that opportunity. So I felt like I needed to, uh, create a company and be professional. So I thought, okay, I need a company. And I was on Google, um, one day, uh, in about 2011, I think. And they had a puzzle. It was called like a Google a day puzzle. And it was a question that took some advanced Googling at the time to come up with the answer. And it was, what, um, is the name of the effect that astronauts experience when they see Earth for the first time. And it was the overview effect, which is a sense of oneness, which is what I think film wow. brings everyone. So that's, I named my company cool. Overview Entertainment to honor all of that, which uh, I set some lofty goals, but I thought, you know what? Like Universal, they're like as big as the universe, so I can go just to the edge of space. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> so, no, no, that, that's a really cool. It's always interesting to hear how these names of companies actually get. That's very cool. Um, yeah. So you are a uh, established author as well. Tell us about the sequence of screenwriting. Yeah, so I started teaching myself um, what I wanted to know. Like, grad school is fantastic. You go, you learn, you have a community. Uh, it's an irreplaceable experience. I always hear filmmakers echo what, like, Tarantino said. Uh, I didn't go to film school. I went to films. And I think it was um, I think it was Paul Thomas Anderson, but it was someone of his ilk who said that they went walked into, I think it was the New York Film School, and the, the screenwriting professor said, oh, if you're going to write uh, Terminator 2, you might as well just turn around and leave. And he did. Um, I hear other writers say, um, oh, you don't need to go to film school, or oh, these guys didn't go to film school. Well, I'll tell you, they did go to film school. It just might not have happened in the classroom. They went to their own film school. They didn't just play some movies and then walk outside, put the camera on the tripod, and make something brilliant. They created their own film school. They filled in the gaps of what they wanted to know, uh, and I did that myself. After grad school, with everything I built, I thought there's still gaps. There's always going to be gaps in what you, what you want to know, what you don't know. So I just got every, you can see behind me all the books up here, and I've got dozens of these screenwriting books. I sat down with book after book after book, and I took notes and notes and notes. I think I've even got my actual notebook here um, from when I went to USC. You can see wow. my actual notebook from, uh, I guess That's it's like 10, crazy. 15 years, 10, 15 years ago. Um, I, I just took notes, 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 and I started imagining myself as my audience and writing to myself saying, okay, the best way to learn something is to be teaching someone or to be in a conversation with someone. So I started picturing that audience in 2011 through 2018. I did that without consciously thinking where it was going. Um, and then, uh, my son was born in 2019 and I thought, okay, I should, uh, I should put this all into a book. I should start a new chapter of my life. So I, I published the secrets of screenwriting, uh, to help people save that like 10 years of struggle. It's, it's a guidepost between the other authors and the other books and the other resources where, uh, for people who don't know where to start, this is 
everything uh, that you've always wanted to know without that like cliche gimmicky, everything you've always wanted to know, it is. It's like, where can I find this information? Well, go to Robert McKee, then go to Sid Field, then go to Aristotle, then go, then go here. But don't just go in one book and think that you're going to learn everything from Save the Cat. I have Save the Cat. I think I've got it. Uh, yeah, I've got it right here on my shelf here. You can see there's my Save the Cat. Um, but you need to go to all of those books with an understanding of like what's in the book so that that one person doesn't guide you through everything. Like even the fact that I've made this book, I shouldn't guide you through everything. There is going to be one book in your life where you're like, this book is essential. And you have to find that book because as a writer or a filmmaker or a director or a producer, you bring in your education, your experience, your film tastes, you have to round that out. And what I'm trying to do with the secrets of screenwriting is to round that out with this core idea that the fifth screenwriting book you read, the th fifth book on film, no matter what four books you read, the fifth one will unlock everything. You, you need to get to that like fifth book. And then you're like, wow, this fifth book is amazing. You're like, no, five books is amazing. The fourth book, the fifth book, the sixth book. Yeah. It's just like you spent that much time and you heard four or five different voices and then you'll hear your own voice. Then you say, yeah. now, now I've got some confidence. This is what I want to do. And I hope with what I'm doing now, I can help people bridge the gap between their idea and their audience with their own voice. So we start to hear you. Like like you read from my uh, article, the writer who, uh, who was brought on to the Batman, he said, you know, yeah, you can echo the great people that, that you, you believed in, but you'll always be their voice. You've got to be your own voice. So with Secrets of Screenwriting, I'm hoping to show people how to not read just one book and have just one voice and then wonder why they didn't get where they wanted to get. Yeah. Um, so let me ask you then, because I, it, to me, it's all, it's all about story. Yeah. You can have the greatest actors in the world. I hope that, I hope that have, all made sense. That all made sense. No, it absolutely made sense. Because yeah. I'll be honest with you, I read... Because when I originally came, I bounced from Boston to Los Angeles and vice versa. And I said, oh, I'm going to come out here and be a screenwriter. And <laughs> wake up call. So then, um, it's obviously, so I picked up a, a screenwriting book. Yeah. And I started reading it because I have a spec script yeah. for those people that don't know. And I actually wanted to, it was a combination of Dexter mm -hmm. from the premise of, I'm the main character, and I have all of these different other stories yeah. and rounders, which, I mean, my the, off time, I like to play poker. The Malkovich so was, movie. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. So it, it was a combination of that. But here's the kicker. I have Asperger's. So I yeah. said, oh, let's, let's give, it a, give him a little twist. Anyways, I digress. So what do you think then makes a good character? Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. A good character um, is three-dimensional. And a good three-dimensional character lives inside a story. And let's, let's work with those two things. First, we'll say, what is a three-dimensional character? So a three-dimensional character has a physicality, and it's a purposeful physicality, which um, is easy to picture if you picture Arnold Schwarzenegger. Arnold Schwarzenegger is very tall and very muscular. And you either play towards or against that. So in a movie where his strength is required, you're playing towards his strength and you, you write into it. Even if you don't know you can afford a, an actor of his stature, maybe it's Dwayne Johnson or, or it's the next iteration of that person, man or woman, young or old. It's a, it's a physically strong person. And you say, like, you know, this character uh, goes to the gym more than they go anywhere else in their life or, or whatever it is you describe uh, in the details of the script. You give them a physicality that means something in the story that they either have to do something very heroic or in, in the opposite sense, you know, you could picture Arnold Schwarzenegger like uh, kindergarten cop where he has to go down to the kindergarten and you say, OK, well, now is his is his physicality a hindrance because he's so much bigger than the children. It, it doesn't work for him, you know, or, or twins with Danny DeVito where you play off that. So you, you give someone some physical characteristic that means something in the film. Uh, and it's not like a 100% requirement. This is just how you start to build a character, is that you purposely give them one physical element, uh, and then you give them one sociological element. So your sociology is how you socialize. That means you have a, a low income, a medium income, a high income, or you're super rich, 
or you grew up in a house that was very small or very poor or very normal or very upper middle class or very rich, or you, you have them dress a certain style, you, you give them one or two meaningful elements. And these, these elements mean something with where you're taking the story. And you only have to pick one or two things. And you only have to describe them once or twice. And the audience and the reader goes, okay, now here's a person of a certain physicality. They're very this or, or not very that. And then I, I can understand where they fit in society. And then you give them a mindset, a, a psychology. So we said a physicality, their physical self, a sociology, where they fit in, in the social world, and then a psychology is their mindset. So are they an optimist? Are they a pessimist? Will they change from one to the other? Do they have a, a, a worldview? Do they have a perspective on something? And you let the audience in to the person in those three singular things. And you say, okay, I know a middle-class person who is of very average height and weight and who has a very average mindset. I know that person. You could, you can make your character like glass of milk, middle America, plain light bulb, regular. And that is a character that that is a character because you've specifically said those three things. They get everything that has a three and a half star review on Amazon. That's, that's their sweet spot. 10% off three and a half stars on Amazon. Like if I'm going to be the screenwriter of that script, I might, I might type that into the script. I would say David goes on Amazon and buys anything that's 10% off three and a half stars or better. And that's his mantra in life. And as the reader, nice. I get it. I go, I know who that person is. They're, they're not focused on glitz and glamor, but they're not poor. And I go, I know that person. And th that's what you want to do. You want to capture in three pieces that the reader knows that person or they've seen that person. And then yes. a character lives in... How, is this the kind of detail you're no, looking for? No, absolutely. Good. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Okay. So a character then lives in a story. And when, when you hear people say what makes a good character, what makes a good character is a display of character. I don't want to get someone who's dressed in the outfit of of the fantasy of the writer, uh, whether that's Ray-Ban sunglasses or a pink briefcase if you're um, in Legally Blonde or anything in between, um, I, I want a display of character. So I want to see a person I recognize for their strength or for their weakness. Okay, you don't have to give a positive ending, an up ending or a Hollywood ending, but you have to give people uh, an emotion to feel when they leave the film. And you do that by saying, did this person have a weak character and they gave into temptation or they didn't meet the challenge or do they have a strong character and they met the challenge or at least they faced the challenge or they tried and something changed in their life meaningfully. And that's what I want to watch because 75, 80, a hundred years into film have you, David, have you seen a superhero and a plane crash and a, and a submarine and a volcano? Have you seen those things? <laughs> right. Yeah, it's 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 one of those things that they always try to give a when it comes to superheroes, they always want to make the superhero have something horrible happen to them so they learn from yeah. that experience. I mean, the first one I'll think of off the top of my head is uh well, I mean, you could think of any super, but Superman. I mean, his planet blows up, right? He has to yeah. live, he has to grow up on Earth. Yeah. Or Doctor Strange where he loses his you know, use of his hands. He's yeah. the best surgeon in New York. He yeah. has to go find himself. Yeah. So it just, it, it's all a matter of how it, whatever that character loses, they have to have something else being filled in in their place. Well, and I think, yeah. So it, come on. Yeah. It, it's more that you want to just give people uh, a display of, human strength or human weakness. I, I just want to see it. I want to see your artistic vision of human character, which is funny that we say character when we mean main actor or lead role. And we also say character, we mean like a character trait, uh, a strength or weakness. Usually when someone says it's a character driven story, they don't mean that the main character drives the narrative. They mean the story is about a strength of character because not every story is sometimes what we love it's spectacle, and I'll, I'll tell you a quick story if you want. Yes, please. So, so I'll, I'll grab another book here. Um, so, in the meantime, while you're grabbing the book, yeah. and I really believe that this is what Marvel does so well. They tell the stories are there, but they make the characters so believable, and you mm. care about them. So, when you were talking about like being in the theater in Endgame, 
I yeah. can't tell you how many times, Brad, I went to see it three times in theaters. Every single audience I sat with exploded at least mm-hmm. two or three times when he picked the Captain America, picked the hammer up or, you know, the, all the women were together or yeah. all of these things. Yeah. Because we knew the characters. Yeah. So go ahead. Please tell your story. Yeah. So I've got this book here, uh, the movie business book. Okay. All right. And it's uh, edited by uh, this man here, Jason Square. I think the focus. Okay. Okay. So it is Jason Squire. What, what? Okay, Squire. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Guy. I see him. Yes. Great guy. Right. So he was he was my prof at USC along with the field. And one day uh, he comes to class and he reminds us all. He's like, "Okay, everybody, you're writing your scripts and you've got your audience in mind." He said, "But don't forget." And when he said this, this was true for the day he said this, and there was no irony. He was not being sarcastic. He was being informative. He said very smartly. He just said the number one movie in America is Beverly Hills Chihuahua. You're smiling. I smiled. He smiled. We all <laughs> smiled. He wasn't making yeah. fun of it. He was just no, reminding yeah. us. He's like, this is what people like. People like a talking dog. Don't don't be angry at it. Don't be funny about it. Lots of writers want to write Russian literature or Charles Dickens or Ernest Hemingway or, or War and Peace or Sylvia Plath. You know, they want to mm-hmm. write uh, Joan Didion. They want to write the great writers of author bookshelves. But America and the world, they like a talking dog. They do. Yeah. It's funny. Yeah. If you if you let go of that high-mindedness and you just go in and watch The Secret Life of Pets, it's hilarious. I've said, That's hilarious. Yeah. I love that movie. Right. Well, I haven't seen the second one, but I yeah. love that movie. Yeah. Oh, just, I mean, it's the, hilarious. The Minions. The Minions make mm-hmm. me laugh every time. And by the way, we're, that's going to be coming out in the middle of July. Yeah. Middle or, or late July. So that that's just that franchise in itself is just huge. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. stuffed animals, character. Yeah. So yeah. I totally understand what you what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. To say that you have to have some particular element in a script is not true. You have to entertain people. That's what you have to do. What we do as screenwriters is we learn. Um, what worked for other people in hopes of like helping our ideas get to the audience because it can't be all two minions saying banana and then falling into the bathroom. <laughs> you know, no, 20, yeah. minutes, 20 minutes later, I might go, okay, something's going to happen here. Um, yeah. So I, I try to teach people that these are movable pieces and they're not mandatory, but wow, they help, you know, they sure help. Yeah. 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 No, it's just one of those things where, and you look at all of the things that are that are out there. I mean, and this is why, you know, we have stories of all kinds, whether they're animated with like a secret life of pets or a superhero movie like an Avengers Endgame or something emotional like a Jojo Rabbit yeah. or, you know, in, in anything else. And so there's a taste out there for everybody. Mm-hmm. And I think that's so incredibly important. Um, so I, so let me backtrack a little. So I, a couple of weeks ago, I did a 2022 mid-year review and talked about all of the films that came out this last six months. So let me ask you, Brad, what is exciting to you coming up for the rest of the year? Thor. What I movies? Wanna... But so, so <laughs> Thor is the number one. Uh, it, it might be. I think uh, there's a new Guardians of the Galaxy three, but I don't think that's until next year. Um, yeah. What What's out there? I want to see Top Gun. Top Gun looks fantastic. Uh, you haven't I'm, seen Maverick yet. I, I'm hearing. You know what? Am I maybe? I've been to the movies since the pandemic happened, but definitely mm-hmm. it's made me a little bit more cautious about just racing out to the theater. Um, right. I've, I've been, um, and I'm going to see it. I, I want to see, um, oh my gosh, I saw um, everything everywhere all at once. And I hear that is supposed to be the film of the year so far. It is uh, very different from a traditional film, you have to go in with a very open mind, and once you get there, it's hilarious. 
It is yeah. uh, fun. It, it is memorable. Uh, I recommend it. I, yeah, definitely I want to see Thor, Love and Thunder. Um, oh my gosh. I, I think I looked at a list recently and uh, practically everything that's out there I want to see. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and, and that not that a problem too? Like for somebody like myself and you and others, there's so much media out there that, I mean, whether it's theaters, I mean, we have a plethora of films the rest of this summer. I mean, we've got Lightyear coming out you know, yeah. next week. We've got Thor, which you were just talking about, coming out at the beginning of July. We've got um, Elvis coming out in a, two weeks, which that I'm great. dying to see. Another great performance, I think, is going to be turned in by Tom Hanks. You've got a couple of, you know, interesting movies down the road. You've got Black Adam in October. You've got the yeah. new Wakanda movie, Wakanda Forever. I'm really dying to see where they take this whole uh, Black Panther thing. Yeah. Um, so, and then on top of that, you've got Netflix, you've got Hulu, you've got Apple TV, you've got, which, by the way, people don't really understand and realize this, Coda Kane. That was the best picture of the year. That was on Apple TV. And oh, yeah. came, so I, I, I love Coda. so much I, media. I don't I don't remember laughing as hard during Coda as anything else. Like Coda, C O D A, Children of Deaf Adults, the uh, uh, Academy Award winner uh, for best screenplay, I believe. Um, I should know that as a screenwriter. I'm, I'm almost certain it was best screenplay. Uh, yes. I laughed out loud so hard. I, I was like, I can't remember laughing louder i thought it was just a fantastic movie You're right that that was streaming on apple yeah and so it's one of those things where um there is so much stuff out there i mean personally uh, there's a couple of movies like like i said black adams coming out yeah. um I, and so wakanda forever as i said and it's just so where so this is going to mean kind of oh, off questions. I, I have ahead. one more. It's The Man from Toronto with Kevin Hart and Woody Harrelson. I saw the trailer. It looks hilarious. I don't know yes. if you've seen this. No, it's that like fish, one I haven't seen. It's a fish out of water story. Kevin Hart gets mistaken for a hitman who is Woody Harrelson. It's in the trailer. <laughs> it looks fantastic. It looks... I, I laughed. It, it looks and, and And that... But see, and that's, see, that goes to show you that... A good movie, like a quick movie, and when I say quick, I mean 90 minutes. You take something like um, the the new Venom movie that just came out, Venom and Carnage, that was only 90 minutes. Yeah. And people go, well, that was, it was only so short. But it was fast. It was tight. It worked. Now, was it a little goofy at times? Yeah, sure. But, I mean, it worked. And so, I mean, the first the first one made close to a half a billion dollars worldwide yeah, with, with tom so Hardy. I, I, I you know it was super fun it got that I, and he did all the voices the, i don't know that it got the best reviews but i enjoyed and, it nonstop. and and here's an interesting since you brought that up yeah jurassic world just opened to 156 yeah. million dollars okay and yeah. what ended up happening was the first at the first time i looked that had a 36 percent rating yeah from the critics on yeah. Rotten Tomatoes, whereas you walk out of the theater, you're almost looking at 75 or 80 percent from the fans. Yeah. And the first, and I said this on a prior podcast, the first one I could really think of off the top of my head was Justice League. Yeah. Justice League was one of those movies that everybody, the critics were like, "This is now." Granted, were there problems with it? You had people step away from it. Okay, fine. But. At the same time, the critics just absolutely destroyed it. But guess what? It made a lot of money. Now, it should have been a billion-dollar film, but that's a whole other thing for another time. So that being said, there's a lot of movies that I think I, – I think it works both ways. I think, number one, there's movies that should get the uh, critical acclaim and mm -hmm. they don't. Like in every, everything, everywhere, all at once, because it's just going to be a flash in the pan and people are not going to remember it. Then I think on the other side of the coin, you have something like um, a movie that's maybe not so good, like a Jurassic World. The critics don't like it, but the fans love it. Yeah. 
yeah. and it goes on and on and on. And yeah. so I think, what do you think about? I, I guess the, I guess the question is the. So let's just move off a little to the Oscars. Do you think the Oscars? Do you watch the Oscars anymore, Brad, or is it I just wa- one of those shows that you watch? Yeah, I watch. So what? What categories besides the big five would you say that are most in, in screenplays? Obviously, what would yeah. you say are the most um, important um, categories to you? Editing. It's not something I understood until I mean I knew what it was, but I didn't understand it. I didn't understand editing uh, at the at the appreciation I have now until I made a short film, which you mentioned earlier, the holdout. Uh, which was great. I had, I had this fantastic team. I had a team of 20 people who just poured their heart and soul into it. I was so happy with, uh, with everyone who participated. And uh, I sat with the editor and one of the producers and watched. And I saw, I think, honestly, my heart sunk when I watched the first footage. I was like, oh, my God. Oh, my God, what did I just make? Because I had all these people and all this effort. And I thought, oh, my God, what did I make? And the editor said, relax, I've got this. And what they did was like magic. Um, taking something that looks very different from the final product. So editing to me is like the unsung art of filmmaking because editors often are a major part of the storytelling, not just like an inch to the left of the frame and a little bit down. So their, their hair is in frame or the lighting's good. It's like they create the emotion that we feel and they choose, um, the feel sometimes there's multiple takes and they, they almost handcraft the tone of the film um, by hearing the actual voice, not like the metaphorical voice, but the actual sound of the person speaking. And they choose from one or two or three choices, but like hundreds of times. And they're like, this is where they sound best. And this is where we're on a little journey here. It's a masterful art. So I'm going to say editing is uh, something that needs a lot more appreciation. Yeah, I agree with you. A lot of, I think we as filmmakers, unless you've made a film like yourself or are a, f- a film aficionado, which, you know, yours truly, you don't really, people just look in front of the camera. They see what's on screen. They say, yeah. oh, okay, great. This person did well or that person did well, but they don't understand, like um, cinematographers. One of the best shots I I love, there's two shots, and it's actually the same movie, and it's Skyfall, and I'm sure being a Bond fan, you know this. The first shot was when, after the explosion happens at MI6, and you're seeing M standing there with a white background and the six coffins and the flag draped over each one of them. The juxtaposition of color <laughs> from the black dress that she was wearing to the white wall to the red yeah. amazing yeah and the other one was is in the same film actually and the cinematographer roger deakins i believe but don't quote me i want to say one of the academy award for it he, what he did in the second when that film is when harvey we're introduced to harvey and bardan's character and he's walking down you see this long i mean there's all these servers and everything and there's just the corridor and he's just walking down he gives this soliloquy Mm -hmm. of like four minutes and it's one he has to do it in one take and it's like my god so i mean behind this behind the camera behind the scenes is so incredibly important yeah yeah. so what um like like birdman too if you saw birdman with uh, michael keaton that had an amazing sequence and an amazing mind-blowing sequence that's one of my favorite movies of the last 10 years it's birdman yeah um, so what are you working on now? Um, uh, are you working on any projects? Yeah, I've got a few scripts uh, I'm working on. I have uh, a World War II thriller, so a family friend uh, told a story about his father. His father was a World War II pilot who was shot down uh, and lived and was uh, in, in a war camp for uh, three years. Uh, so we're crafting a story that's much more than just like war and airplanes and, and prison camp. It's the story of a person uh, who also returns from war and is uh, facing uh, the kind of beliefs people held uh, all those years ago that limited their worldview. It was like uh, this man risked his life to fight the limiting beliefs of uh, the opposition in World War II, which, you know, he's a North American fighting for North America. 
and uh, he returns thinking that he's, you know, saved a piece of the world with, with his efforts, only to be met with, like, other people from North America who hold different but similar limiting beliefs, uh, and that's his journey um, of how to overcome that. So, you know, it's basically a man's search for family and where he belongs uh, amidst those kinds of limiting beliefs. Um, so I'm working on that. Um, I've got uh, a TV um, series I'm working on with a great team um, about people who have different abilities. So this is like a, a drama docuseries. So it's, it's dramatic in tone. It's not comedic, but it is real people in real life. It's not scripted. And it features uh, people who have gone through some kind of challenge in life where their personal abilities have been limited uh, from where they were either by birth or by, by accident or, or by illness. So their vision, their hearing, uh, use of limb, uh, emotional, physical, uh, stroke, uh, spinal injury. Um, and we're, we're bringing people on a journey from uh, a place where um, they, they have a belief of their limitations and we're taking them beyond limits. We're saying like, you know, um, there's a lot more that you can do than perhaps what you think. And we're showing um, other people who have overcome, people who've had the same situation uh, and overcome those limiting beliefs and gone on to like climb Mount Everest. Uh, wow. it, it's really inspiring. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and the uh, guys I'm working with, they're, they're fantastic. They themselves have overcome uh, uh, stroke and spinal cord injury and like oh, severe, wow. yeah, life-changing. My goodness. Uh, yeah, yeah, life-changing incidents that they have turned into uh, opportunity uh, by helping other people. They dedicated their lives to helping other people recover from stroke and to be inspired and motivated through uh, lo loss of the use of limb and so forth. Uh, but they're, they're not letting that stop them from living a full life and so their inspiration inspires me, and, and I'm just sort of—I just jumped on to their uh, their great moving uh, flying carpet here. <laughs> and I and I think and I think that's something that's with all of the with all of the world events out there and what's going on and whatever. I think something like that, when you're able to show inspiration to somebody else and say, "You can do this," yeah. regardless of nationality, creed, sex, whatever. And just say, you know what? Humans inspiring other humans. And that's something we sorely lacked in not only film, but, you know, in today's society. And when you have something like that, and it's uplifting, and that I think is so impressive, that that's the kind of thing that we need out there. And it's like, listen, forget about your problems. This is something you can do whatever you want to do. And I mean, God bless those people that are able to do that because I know most people, I know myself, speaking for myself, I couldn't do what the, these people have been able to do. Well, well that's so. the thing. That's the thing is, is that's a belief you hold. And, and the aim of our show is to help you see that maybe that limit doesn't exist. Yeah. Maybe the only thing that stops you is a couple uh, shoelace ties and an open door. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah. Maybe. So any young, so if we have any aspiring screenwriters out there. Yeah. Yeah. What would be the couple of pieces of advice that you could say, listen, grab onto this? What would you I, tell I think, them? I would say reach out to me on LinkedIn and, and let me teach you. Uh, I, I'm, I'm teaching people with screenwriting live, which uh, we're launching. Um, reach out. Like, like find someone like myself who can teach you, find someone who has spent 10 years uh, and let them save you five. Like, it's going to take time. The best example I could say is, David, uh, do you think a 12-year-old can drive a car uh, mechanically? Do you think they could sit behind the wheel and, and make it work? Like, do no. you think their feet could reach the pedals and their arms could no. reach the steering wheel? No. no. Right. But I could certainly tell someone in about... 30 seconds that the gas means go and the brake means stop and to move the wheel is to move the car, right? Would, yes. Would you want to ride in the car with someone who got like a 30 second driving lesson? No. Right. Exactly. No. So you can get a 30 second lesson in storytelling, but I don't want to pay 20 bucks and sit for two hours to watch someone who got a 30 second storytelling lesson. So there isn't a 30 second storytelling lesson. There's the advice to go learn, to, to go get four or five good books, get Aristotle, 
Aristotle teaches you in his poetics. It's not about poetry. It is a term that just means a condensed piece of information. And he says, look, this is uh, what like 2,000 years of storytelling has told me. That this is, this is where audiences show up. Basically, Aristotle, about uh, 2,000 years ago, uh, he got like a, a PhD in storytelling by studying every play that had ever been uh, put on and recorded that he could have access to. And um, it stands the test of time for 2,000 years because it is, it's, it's the same way if someone said you're going to build a house, it has a door and a window and a roof, no matter what you're doing, right? I wouldn't be able to get in a building that didn't have a door and I wouldn't be able to look out if it didn't have a window and I wouldn't be covered if it didn't have a roof. Aristotle basically says like, this is your door, this is your roof, this is your window. And you can put them anywhere you want. You can make them out of anything you want, but you need these pieces. I, I would go to Sid Field from there because he focuses specifically on screenplay. Um, and he gives it very simply and tells you how you need to have drama, conflict, action, and character to get a story. It's much more complicated than that. I would go to Robert McKee. He gives you the mechanics of story. Um, and from there, I would branch out to any other two books that grab your interest. But I would find someone like myself or come to me, reach out, uh, screenwriting.live on Instagram. And you can find me on LinkedIn at Brad Rochefort. Um, or I think it's even linkedin.com uh, slash Rochefort, R-O-C-H-E-F-O-R-T. And, and find someone that's teaching you storytelling uh, that's today, because a lot of those great teachers, they're from 1970s, 1980s, 1990s. And since then, a lot of people have built upon their platform something marvelous. And we all owe them a debt of gratitude for the work that they did, but we're also 20 and 30 years past their initial entry into that. Uh, so find someone who you can like connect with live and like get your questions answered, because um, you might save yourself years of time uh, and spend instead those years developing a great piece of writing that is like good from the start rather than, again, to use like a building analogy, rather than building a, a roof that's the, the most fantastic roof ever and it's just sitting on the grass and then you constantly have to lift the roof up to get something underneath it. Well, that's not how houses are built. Uh, and, and the same way for stories, you shouldn't be building certain parts of the story first and then always trying to keep this one beautiful piece you say oh this is i love mob movies and and card games because i think david you like mob movies and card games right yes yeah you wouldn't yes. want to write this like amazing mob movie card game with this great crisp dialogue and this great information and then you always have to reference it and you're like oh but earlier i made this person from boston so he has to be from boston i can't yeah. change the dialogue right. that that kind of thing you can benefit greatly from spending the time and effort to find the person that you connect with and letting them guide you, like get into their classroom, get into their Zoom room, get into their books, get into their blogs and say, OK, how do I start on my journey? And then craft it from there. Be your own artist. Like, don't, yeah. don't ever take one person's voice and be like, I got to be just like this person. No, you do not uh, be your own artist, but uh, but get some help. A hundred percent. Get some person uh, that's been there and let them help you. Fantastic. Um, the what you were just talking about. So, and I think when like, one of those great screenwriters can come up with all of those elements. And I think this on one last point is this is why Star Wars worked so well because yeah. you know back in 1977 because you had the drama, you had the comedy, you had the action adventure, you had the the space adventure and the sci fi. So it was an elements, all the elements. And then it really just, and nobody had ever seen anything like it before. Yeah. Star Wars was made for only three or four million dollars. Mm -hmm. And that's why Lucas made, you know, I mean, there's a whole other story behind that. But it was made for such a small budget that when it exploded, that he was able to go on, do Empire in 80, Jedi in 83, and the rest is history. So, but um, yeah, no, it, it's just screenwriting stories are so important. Aren't they? And it's just if you can tell the right story for the right time, whatever it is, you know. And so, speaking of stories, I've always thought that every movie, every person is a walking, talking movie because yeah. they've encountered love, loss, you know, adversity, and everything else. And go, going further into that, in a couple of weeks, 
So coming up on the podcast today, we're actually going to be doing Lightyear, um, which I'm sure Brad is a big, you know, big fan of Pixar and you know oh, yeah. whatnot. So there's some yeah. there's some um, there's some news that just broke, and we'll, we'll talk with Elisa about that today and get her thoughts on that. Um, also, pr- starting in July, I think what I'm going to do is Sci-Fi Sundays fell through. So what we're going to do is I'm going to sit down and do Mob Mondays. I will be sitting down and we're going to be talking about The Godfather, The Godfather 2, Goodfellas, Casino, Mean Streets, The Departed. I could go on and on and on. So oh. we're going to be talking all about those movies. Um, and Love then the in Departed. July, Love yeah. The Departed. Yeah. And it's hard to believe that that was the first movie he ever won Best Director for. And it's just like you look at all of these. It's, you know, like I was. So we just did a. If you want to go back and listen to a Steven Spielberg podcast, uh, Lisa and I did last week. Um, we talk all about Steven Spielberg movies and we count down our top 10. And what I was saying to them is that it was like, kiddingly, it was like trying to pick your, your favorite child. There mm-hmm. are so many good. I mean, like I had to post to 10. <laughs> I, amazing. I mean, obviously. I think Spielberg, and look, once again, film is all subjective, but for me, Schindler's List is his master class. Hands down. Hands down. Mm-hmm. So, but yeah. Uh, so we're going to be doing bio movies in, uh, next week. We're going to yeah. be doing all about biography movies, whether it's Elvis, in, in light of Elvis coming up. We had Joy with Jennifer Lawrence, yeah. a movie I love. I think he should have won the Oscar. Steve Jobs. Okay. And yeah. Kate Winslet. Kate Winslet was nominated for Best Actress. He was nominated for Best Actor. Danny Boyle was, I believe, nominated for Best Director. Unbelievable movie. Um, yeah. And then coming up at the beginning of July, as I said, we're going to be sitting down and doing the Thor Love and Thunder preview. And then we got a bunch of stuff coming up for the rest of the summer. So. Um, yeah, this has been an absolute treat, I have to say. Um, and we're well, definitely, if you, if you like to come back, you, we need to maybe when time permits down the end of the road, the end of the summer or whatever, we will set up another, uh, time for you to come back and, and just talk all about the movies. I love so, talking about movies, and I'm yeah. so grateful for the opportunity to be here on Real Talk with uh, with you, David. So, for David Steele and Brad Brassaport, this has been Real Talks. <laughs>